Yeah. Jimmy, thanks a lot. Uh, I want to welcome everybody today to our, our Zoom meeting. I got to tell you, we've got an exciting panel that's going to speak with us today on some of the issues that are going on with the coronavirus. Uh, and I'm pretty confident these people have all the answers. Okay. Uh, so let me also say, I want to thank Dr. Weaver and Dr. McClellan for taking time out of what I know is a very busy schedule for y'all to, to share some great information with us. I want to thank Jeff Sostrom at the Galveston Economic Development Partnership for partnering with us on this, on this Zoom meeting today. Let me go over the agenda so everybody will kind of know what, what the playbook says. We're going to start with introductions. Again, I, I will introduce Dr. Weaver. Uh, Jeff will introduce Dr. McClellan. Then we'll have the, the corona, uh, coronavirus update by the, by the uh, two panelists. And hopefully, maybe at the end, maybe we'll have you know, 8, 10, 12 minutes, something like that, to ask a few questions of them. Um, so with that, with that, let me begin by introducing uh, Dr. Scott Weaver. Uh, he is the director of UTMB Institute for Human Infectious and Immunity and the Sci scientific director for the Galveston National Lab. He's also chairman of the Department of Microbiology and Immunology at UTMB. Dr. Weaver is an internationally recognized virulist and vector biologist and expert on mosquitoes and virus mosquito interactions. In 2016, Dr. Weaver received funding from the U.S. Center of Disease and Control and Prevention to establish the Western Gulf Center of Excellence for Vector-Borne Diseases. Dr. Weaver's work has been published in more than 300 articles in prestigious scientific journals, and he has written more than 90 reviews and chapters. His research has been continuously funded by the National Institute of Health and Department of Defense, Department of Homeland Security, the Defense Advanced Research Projects, DARPA, and the CDC, among others. He teaches extensively and has served as a member, as a mentor for 20 PhD students and 23 postdoctoral fellows. He was named the Leon Broomberg Professor of Excellence in Teaching. Dr. Weeby is a recipient of numerous prestigious awards, including the Walter Reed Medal, the American Society of Tropical Medicine and Hygiene, the Robert C. Gallo Award for Scientific Excellence from the Global Virus Network, and in 2017, he was named a fellow in the National Academy of Inventors. He earned his BS degree from the College of William and Mary in 1979, his MS degree in entomology from Cornell University in 1982, and a PhD degree in virology from the University of California, San Diego in 1993. Following the postdoctoral fellowship, in this department, the, the epidemiology, the public health at Yale University School of Medicine, he joined UTMB and the faculty of 1994. So Jeff, would you like to introduce Dr. McClellan? Bob, thank you so much. And also I echo all of your appreciation. I'd also like to thank Becky Trout Unbehagen for helping us get this coordinated today. Um, I gotta admit to you, I feel a little inferior as I reviewed the resumes of Dr. Weaver and Dr. McClellan. Uh, we are so fortunate to have these folks uh, not only doing the work that they're doing, but they're doing it here in our region, and, and we should be proud of that. Uh, it's my privilege to introduce Dr. McClellan. She's the medical director of the Biocontainment Treatment Unit and the director of biosafety for research related infectious pathogens at UTMB. Uh, Dr. McClellan completed her medical education at Tulane University of New Orleans after pursuing a degree in anthropology at Princeton University and a master's in public health at the University of California at Berkeley. She began a combined residency in internal medicine and pediatrics at Los Angeles County, the University of Southern California, and completed that program at the University of Miami, Jackson Memorial Hospital. Dr. McClellan went on to Emory University for her fellowship in adult infectious diseases and stayed on there as faculty in the HIV care program. In 1997, Dr. McClellan returned to her hometown of New Orleans and to Tulane University. For 20 years, she held dual faculty appointments in the section of infectious diseases in the School of Medicine and in the Tropical Medicine Department of, and in the Tropical Medicine Department of the School of Public Health and Tropical Medicine. Dr. McClellan joined UTMB in March of 2018. Dr. McClellan has personal experience treating patients in an outbreak including outbreaks of the most dangerous diseases in the world. She has tended patients during Ebola outbreaks in the Sierra Leone in West Africa, and most recently in the Democratic Republic of the Congo in the midst of extreme civil unrest. During the COVID-19 pandemic, Dr. McClellan has remained on the front lines 
and ran a successful clinical trial for remdesivir in partnership with the National Institutes of Health and partners from around the globe. Uh, Dr. Weaver, Dr. McClellan, thank you so much for giving us time today. Uh, we are so appreciative of having you participate and share some of your insight with us. And with that, I'll, I'll turn it over to, to you. Well, thanks very much for those very generous introductions. I thought uh, I'll start out today with a little bit of the basics behind the virus. And then Dr. McClellan can tell you uh, a lot better than I can about the clinical disease, the situation here at UTMB with, with patients and, and the epidemiology of spread in our area. Uh, I'm guessing that most people watching today, probably a year ago, many had never even heard of a coronavirus. But actually coronaviruses have been around for a long time and we've known about them for a long time. Uh, even before 2002, uh, we knew that coronaviruses caused a number of important diseases in, in agriculturally important animals. So they got a lot of attention and research and we learned a lot about how they replicate and uh, how they uh, hijack cells to make many more virus particles in themselves and how that leads to disease in, in animals. And in fact, we knew a little bit about coronaviruses in humans because even in 2002, we knew that there were two coronaviruses that caused what we normally refer to as the common cold. That is a mild, in healthy people, a mild flu-like illness that tends to be seasonal. Along the same uh, time, we see influenza starting in the fall and, and ending in the early spring. Uh, the common cold is actually caused by a lot of different kinds of viruses and coronaviruses and influenza viruses are just two of, of several different types. But uh, none of these viruses really were uh, serious risks to human health for, uh, for healthy people. So they didn't get a whole lot of attention uh, on the medical side of things. And then the situation changed very dramatically. In late 2002, uh, in China, an outbreak of respiratory disease emerged. Uh, there was not very much information at the very beginning. The information available was suppressed, but eventually that virus found its way into Hong Kong and then spread to a few other countries around the world and caused about 7,000 human infections. It got a lot of attention because um, the mortality rate in those people was quite high. In fact, it was it was higher than what we're seeing with the current coronavirus outbreak. And there was a lot of concern with that virus beginning to spread by people traveling on airplanes that we might be seeing a pandemic on the way with that first SARS coronavirus. And SARS, by the way, stands for severe acute respiratory uh, syndrome. And um, so it caused a, a kind of uh, pulmonary disease uh, not too different than what we're seeing with the current outbreak, but with more uh, chance of fatality in people who became infected. Very fortunately, that outbreak was stopped uh, after only limited spread around the world. It get, didn't get to most countries like we've seen this year. And the outbreak was over by the spring, uh, early summer of 2003. So it only lasted about six months. Uh, but that was really uh, a red flag that uh, we needed to find out more about these coronaviruses. And in fact, follow-up investigations uh, done mainly in China revealed that this virus actually was transmitted to people in live animal markets, uh, people who were exposed to or purchased for eating an animal called a civet, which is a kind of a, a cat-sized mammal that is that was sold in, in markets in many different parts of Asia. And then even further study revealed that the virus reached civets by ultimately coming from bats. And in fact, a lot of research done since 2003 has shown us that there are lots of different coronaviruses that circulate in, in bats all over the world. The ones that are the closest relatives to the SARS viruses uh, tend to circulate in Asia. And in fact, uh, in work done between 2003 and uh, early this year, going out and sampling bats in different kinds of habitats like caves in China and other parts of Asia, 
revealed that viruses that are very closely related to these SARS viruses that can cause severe disease in people are found in bats in widespread locations around Asia. So uh, the SARS virus really got a lot of attention. There was a lot of uh, funding by the National Institutes of Health to uh, study these viruses, to develop uh, vaccines to prevent another SARS outbreak or antiviral drugs to treat people who became infected in the future. But because the outbreak ended so quickly and not very many people were affected, interest in that SARS coronavirus waned very quickly over time. Um, probably by about 10 years later, there was very limited study of these viruses by only a few laboratories in the world. Um, there were some uh, vaccines developed and tested in animals. One of them, in fact, was developed here in our region through a collaboration with Baylor College of Medicine and a UTMB scientist named Kent Seng. Uh, but that virus never reached clinical trials. Uh, there simply was not any commercial interest in developing a SARS vaccine because with only 7,000 cases or so in six months and then nothing after that for uh, more than a decade, there was certainly no clear market for a SARS vaccine. And so although the, the NIH and other governments around the world funded some research, the hundreds of millions of dollars that it takes to develop a vaccine from scratch the whole way through clinical trials to licensure was certainly not available through the typical funding mechanisms. And that is big pharma companies usually pay for these kind of vaccines. So fast forward uh, to December of last year, uh, there were some reports of uh, pulmonary illness in, in China uh, by December. It, it turns out retrospectively now, the first cases probably occurred a little before that. But uh, in January of this year then, the outbreak started getting a lot of attention. The, the World Health Organization uh, getting as much information as they could from China uh, finally determined that the outbreak was spreading from person to person. Although it began in a, a place in Wuhan uh, in the region of an animal market, actually a seafood market, and there was early suspicion that the virus had come from something being sold in that market, there's never really been an animal found to be infected in that setting. and and. Uh, so it wasn't clear at the beginning whether the virus was just spreading from animals to people and not going any further in people or whether it was spreading from person to person, but that very quickly became clear. And then, uh, of course, uh, the concern was spread around the world, uh, uh, grew very rapidly as the cases mounted, especially in Wuhan and then other areas of China. And uh, I'm sure that most of you are familiar with the, the story since January, but in trying to identify where this virus came from, um, there's really not a smoking gun yet, uh, like there was in 2002. Uh, there have been coronaviruses found in China that are similar in their genetic makeup to this new SARS coronavirus 2, but not similar enough that we know there was a direct transmission to that particular population of bats to humans. Uh, but there are probably lots more coronaviruses present all over the world that we've never sampled, even with some of the research that was taking place between 2003 and, and this year. So the, uh, we still don't know exactly where this virus came from, how it got into people, but uh, it began spreading very, very rapidly. It, and it turns out, I think Dr. McClellan can tell you much more about this, that it spread quite efficiently from person to person. Uh, there are a lot of asymptomatic infections, which makes it a little bit more difficult to track cases when you can't rely on just having someone come to a clinical setting to be diagnosed. And uh, for a variety of other reasons, including some bad missteps uh, by different parts of the US government early in the outbreak, it's of course spread beyond control in many parts of the world. I, I wanna talk a little bit about something you may have seen in the news uh, this past uh, four or five days. And that's because a, a paper was published, a scientific paper last week that involved a collaboration with uh, three different universities, Tulane University, 
the University of Pittsburgh and UTMB, along with the National Institutes of Health, to study one uh, mode of transmission from person to person of this new SARS coronavirus 2. At the beginning of the outbreak, there was a lot of uh, assumptions made because we really didn't know much about this virus. It was similar in some ways to the first SARS coronavirus, but different in other ways. There were a lot of assumptions made that a lot of the spread was due to very close human contact, people contaminating their hands by touching their mouth or their nose, and then either directly contaminating other people or contaminating surfaces that served as a vehicle for the virus to move from one person to another. Uh, there, there's little doubt that some infections occur that way, but I think the evidence has been growing ever since uh, February that airborne transmission is very important for this virus to spread. And this uh, new paper published last week was kind of the newest chapter in the growing evidence of airborne spread. And the way that this uh, study was done was um, the virus was grown in large quantities in cell cultures in laboratories here at UTMB and other places. And then it was taken to a special facility um, called an aerobiology facility. We have one of them here in the Galveston National Lab where we intentionally create aerosols that include bacteria or viruses um, to do experimental infections of animals because this is the most common way that a biological weapon would be spread and that some kinds of viruses and bacteria are spread naturally. And uh, an aerosol, uh, the way we define it in the world of virology is uh, a spray, a collection of very tiny droplets in the size range of one to five microns. So this, these individual droplets or particles are smaller than you can see with the naked eye. But sometimes when there's a very dense cluster of them, you can see the aerosol like would come out of the, the, the end of a can, a, a spray can that you use to create aerosols. And these aerosols then can be uh, generated in the lab with very tightly controlled droplet sizes. They can be put into special chambers and we can monitor them over time to see how long the virus can survive in these tiny droplets and particles. And the, the most important finding for this new paper was that this new SARS coronavirus can survive at least 16 hours suspended in the air in an aerosol. The, the previous work done uh, a few months ago indicated it could last as long as three hours, but it turns out to be much longer. The other important finding is that this new SARS coronavirus survives a little bit longer than the first SARS coronavirus or another virus called MERS coronavirus, which stands for Middle East Respiratory Syndrome. This is a virus that's been infecting people since 2012 when it was first detected, and it spread probably from bats to camels to people. But fortunately, it hasn't spread very much from person to person. So part of the reason that uh, the new SARS coronavirus may be spreading more efficiently than the first SARS or MERS may have something to do with its ability to survive in these aerosols. And so what happens is when, uh, when we're infected with uh, coronavirus or other respiratory viruses, at, at, when we're breathing or talking or singing, we're constantly producing these aerosol sized droplets that are uh, emitted from our mouth uh, or, or our nose um, when, we're, when we're breathing or talking. And uh, usually the, these, of course, don't contain viruses or other microorganisms if we're not infected and they're harmless. But it turns out that uh, if viruses replicate in the right part of a respiratory tract, they can be very concentrated in these, these aerosols that we produce. And then they can be exhaled into a room environment. And if that room uh, is, has poor ventilation, if it's an indoor location, outdoor locations tend to be safer because there's usually wind to dissipate such an aerosol. But if it's an indoor space with poor ventilation and if people are crowded together in that kind of a room and not wearing a mask makes it even higher risk, you can have very efficient transmission of aerosol-borne viruses. In fact, during the Cold War, both the US and the former USSR uh, governments intentionally exposed people to aerosols to show 
how they could spread a disease very rapidly as a biological weapon. So we know a lot about how this works from some older viruses. And uh, so we think that, um, that the, the highest risk for aerosol spread is in places like bars, where people don't tend to wear masks, they don't tend to distance themselves. They also tend to mingle around a small room rather than staying at one table, like in a restaurant, which might be a little bit lower risk uh, environment for aerosol borne transmission. Uh, and, and so this undoubtedly had something to do with the decision made by the governor to close bars a couple weeks ago and to reduce the capacity of restaurants because uh, uh, although restaurants maybe are a little safer because people stay put at one table in a little bit smaller groups, uh, aerosol transmission is probably occurring in restaurants as well, especially when the tables are spaced too closely together. So I think the evidence is, is growing that the airborne transmission of this virus is a major mode of, of why it's spreading so efficiently. And, uh, and we really need to take these, these kind of measures to limit the density of people to keep them wearing masks when they're in risky environments and to close places that are the highest risk environments where we simply don't have much control over people's behavior like, like bars, for example. So I'll, I'll let Susan uh, pick it up from there and tell you a little bit more about the disease and the epidemiology and what's going on here at UTMB, including the clinical trial she's been involved in. Sure, Dr. McClellan, sorry to interrupt, right bef uh, just before you start there, I want to remind our attendees that if they want to ask any questions, please feel free to use the Q&A button down at the bottom of the screen about right there, um, and we can try and get to your questions uh, towards the end of the presentation. Sorry for interrupting you, Dr. McClellan. Uh, no problem at all. Um, I, I hope the noise that I'm suddenly hearing isn't passing through. Uh, okay, so um, as Dr. Weaver said, my, my slide is a little bit more clinical and to some extent the public health. I think we intersect on the public health aspects and things like that. And, uh, and so I am primarily a clinician and an educator and uh, I have done a lot, a lot more research support around the world than I have done, been the primary investigator for, for research, um, but which is what led me to get involved in the clinical trials for coronavirus. But a couple of things that, that I wanted to talk about from the sort of public health perspective, because I think a lot of times the public is very confused about why the recommendations about what to do and about this coronavirus changed over time. And uh, the most important thing is to remind, remind people that this is a situation in which we're learning. One coronavirus is not the same as another coronavirus is not the same as another coronavirus. Otherwise, we'd have SARS instead of, uh, instead of COVID. So initially, when this virus was identified and the reports came out of China, uh, it, it, the information was conveyed to the rest of the world comparatively quickly compared to the last SARS-1. But there was still a little bit of uh, sort of slowness of information getting out and the public health response has to be very careful not to go overboard for all the reasons that one is hearing now, that uh, if on the basis of extremely limited information, we had been talking about a shutdown back at, in January, that clearly would have been untenable. And besides that, the, inf the, the first information that we were getting was eh, not so sure about how much person to person. And the second thing that most specialists did was figure, okay, it's a coronavirus. Let's look at how SARS worked in terms of our ability to break transmission of SARS. And one of the most important real differences between the original SARS, besides the fact that it actually had a higher fatality rate, was that almost all transmission was done by people who were clearly symptomatic. And more than that, who had a fever? Hence, the famous temperature screening. It made a difference with SARS. Uh, and so that's, there was a lot of calls for instituting that sort of thing. Many people did institute temperature screening. And also, this led to, to the case definition that was being used in the United States for prioritizing testing, which was somebody who had a fever, was short of breath, had a cough. 
okay, rather than say, have a little bit of a flu-like feeling and maybe a runny nose and maybe not, you know, or anything at all. Because again, the assumption was most of transmission would be driven as it had been with other similar diseases by people who were symptomatic and unlikely to be driven by people who were either pre-symptomatic or asymptomatic. That's a little bit of a terminology difference that's coming up in some of the uh, literature. An asymptomatic person would be someone who never had symptoms. A pre-symptomatic person is somebody who is not symptomatic yet, but is going to become symptomatic. Exactly which of those contributes most to transmission with, with COVID, we don't know. Probably the pre-symptomatic people, but again, uh, that's, that's very, you know, we can't really take our people into that nice aerosol chamber and tell them to start coughing and talking and singing and then, then, then do that. I mean, we can, but it's not as easy to do as to create an aerosol uh, or even try to infect an animal model or something like that in the lab. So as information came out, there were best educated guesses based on similar coronaviruses being made and therefore these recommendations of what kind of, uh, of, of of isolation to do and so on, and who should be isolated and whether we needed to worry about people who were symptomatic or not. And the, all of the arguments and discussions about masks early on really had to do with the concept that droplets and fomites, so a fomite is something that gets contaminated with your secretions, okay, your spit, your cough stuff, your droplets, your runny nose, and then you touch it and you get it on your hands, okay. Uh, and there was a lot of concern that if people wore masks to protect themselves, they might be more likely to actually inoculate themselves because their hands were contaminated. And also that as long as they stayed far away, it would be okay because, you know, and also that asymptomatic people probably didn't spread. So those were all based on our understanding of prior coronaviruses and other types of respiratory viruses that, that uh, we felt like spread in a similar way. And I'm using the royal we here. I wasn't the person making up all of these uh, recommendations and so on. But, um, and, but as things change, so first off, when there's very little in the community, it doesn't help to go around wearing a mask, especially if these are in short supply and in the healthcare facilities where you need to protect people who are definitely going in to take care of these patients, uh, we needed to worry about that. As the disease made its way into the population. One, we learned some things epidemiologically. Just by looking at patterns of spread, we learned that it was clear that people who had very minimal symptoms could transmit. Potentially people who had no symptoms, never had symptoms, but certainly, almost certainly people who were pre-symptomatic. Also uh, then, so it became an idea that the current recommendation to wear a mask is really to prevent you in your asymptomatic or pre-symptomatic stage from being the person who's spreading it to other people. So it really, the mask issue for the general public has gone from being wear it to keep yourself safe to wear it to keep everybody else safe because you won't know if you have it. And there are a lot of people out there who've had it and don't know, okay? and and may not know, depending upon how good our testing is for antibodies and things like that. So right now, wearing a mask is to protect other people. Now, the research that Dr. Weaver and his group have done is really important because a lot of people approach the mask wearing thing as, well, if I just kind of stay six feet away from people, that's fine. They tell me six feet is fine and, uh, and it's no biggie. Well, the information that we're getting now about the, the persistence of these aerosols and the duration of, of transmissibility or longevity of this virus in, in these aerosols makes it clear that the just six feet away thing doesn't work. And I can tell you in a bar, people who sort of say, well, that's about six feet. So now I have to yell at you and to yell at you above the noise of the bar or whatever in order to make myself heard is simply going to project more. And so, uh, so, so transmission is likely to occur in a lot of those ways as well. So wearing the mask very much to protect other people, somewhat to protect yourself because it will prevent some of those aerosols from getting in. The other thing about transmission a little bit to understand is that it's probably dose related. In other words, if you stand right up to somebody and they cough really hard in your face, you're gonna get a lot more viral particles hitting your mucous membranes, breathing in and so on. 
uh, than if you walk through a room where somebody has coughed 10 minutes ago. There might be some viral particles floating around in that room, but the likelihood is less that you'll get a whole lot of it. So, so there's always degrees. This is not a virus, we don't think, like Ebola, where maybe as little as one viral particle getting into you is going to make you get sick. This is probably one where you need to be exposed to a number of them. And so everything that you do to reduce your exposure, maybe not to the impossibility of a viral particle getting to you, but reducing the number of viral particles getting to you is going to help to reduce your transmission. So all of this is things that we're learning slowly over time. And as far as the public health response and recommendations, as far as distancing, as far as masks, as far as shutting down and so on, has to move with that development of knowledge. And, uh, and, and so we, at every point, are making our best educated guess. And I think the vast majority of public health authorities have also said, as far as we know. And that's, that's sort of what we have to do. So I want to sort of go over that a little bit uh, in terms of mechanics of transmission. Um, now, as, as far as what the disease looks like, well, it looks pretty awful. I can tell you that uh, hospital that I'm rounding in now, the intensive care unit is uh, pretty much full of COVID patients. And I will also tell you that only a minority of them are the over 65 age group. So we have an assortment of people on ventilators who were in their 30s and 40s, and they really probably didn't think of themselves as being disposable. Um, so, uh, so it needs to be very much recognized that this is not a disease that only affects the old, the frail, the already uh, at death's door, that I think a lot of people tend to think of it as, as something that isn't going to affect them because I'm a healthy person. Well, I think a lot of these people that I'm taking care of now uh, and that are intubated thought that they were healthy people as well. Uh, and so, so it really can affect everybody. Now, proportionally, it is definitely true. More of the younger people will survive than of the older people. But, uh, but when you are talking about a disease spreading rapidly in a large population of young people, you're going to get a bunch of those young people in the hospital. So we're seeing that a lot. And what we think about this disease, and this has to do with some of the way some of the treatments work, is this is a disease that when you get infected, in other words, you breathe in, breathe in the virus, breathe in enough of it, uh, or a gob of somebody's droplets hits your mucous membrane, or in whichever way that you manage to share somebody else's virus, um, it takes a few days to start cooking up inside your system. We think in general, it's probably, you know, Five-ish is fairly typical. Some people may start to become symptomatic as soon as two days, uh, maybe as long as 10 days. Um, and for, you know, 14 days is getting pretty far out there, but that would be sort of the long end range. But the first symptoms are very nonspecific. The first symptoms many people describe as, oh, I just felt really tired. Uh, I had a sore throat for a day. Um, not the shortness of breath not a documented fever, not a temperature that you can measure, but uh, maybe achiness, flu-like, nonspecific flu-like symptoms, which are the beginning of the prodromal type of symptoms of, of a lot of diseases, including some of the really scary ones that we worry about, such as Ebola. However, then while this virus is replicating in your system and growing, that's the time. So that time that you have that first day of G, I just don't feel good today. I've got some aches and pains. Maybe I'll go take a nap and sleep for a while. That's probably the day that you're most infectious. The two days before, not so bad either. And a couple of days after, not so bad either. By 10 days after that, the viral load in your respiratory tract, which is what's producing the little droplets, the aerosols as you speak, as you sing, as you cheer at the football game, whatever, uh, has really gone down a fair bit although that will vary between different people. But the highest infectivity is for someone who is symptomatic is at those very early symptoms. Now, a lot of people then are gonna sit at home and maybe still feel kind of crummy. Some will start getting fevers, some will start getting diarrhea and so on, but their breathing seems to be okay. And the sort of average time for breathing to go down the tubes is at about a week. And that's when people come to the hospital. Now, 
Is that all people? No, not at all. A lot of people only have that, maybe only have that first day or have that first several days of not feeling very good or have a mild amount of breathing trouble and cough and so on. It's never quite enough to drive them to the hospital. But when people become quite ill, the people that are having a more severe disease, about a week to 10 days, they come to the hospital because they're really realizing that they can't breathe. Their chest is often hurts to some extent. They feel like they can't catch their breath. Uh, they're unable to perform their daily activities and so on. And that's a common type of presentation. The other thing you've probably heard about is people lose their sense of smell. Now that can happen real early on, losing that sense of smell or that sense of taste. And one of the things that we see is people coming into the hospital because they're dehydrated because they haven't felt like putting anything in their mouths because it tastes funny, it feels funny. And so they've become dehydrated because they're just kind of pulling up in bed because they don't feel good. So that's another real interesting symptom with this, with this virus. It's seen in other viruses sometimes, but it seems to be quite common with this one. So it's a, a little bit of a tip off symptom as well. And we ask people that when they show up in the emergency room. We think that second part where people really start to have problems with their breathing is due more to an inflammatory response that's provoked by the virus than by the virus itself. So in other words, some diseases, as the virus level goes very high, that's when you become very, very sick. So for Ebola, for example, the virus level goes up and up and up and up until you die, okay? Or you get your antibody response, you get your immunological response and you control it and it gets better. With COVID, the immunological response is part of the disease process. It's part of what makes people very, very sick. So when we're talking about clinical therapies and treatments, there's two sides to it. There's trying to stop the virus and there's trying to deal with what seems to be an overcompensated immunological response. There are other diseases that we see that happen in, okay? Uh, um, dengue, for example, is one that the immunological response seems to give us the greatest problem. And, uh, and some people will go into that exuberant immunological response and some won't. The therapies that you probably heard the most about, uh, there's, there's uh, the reasons that they are proposed to work are either they kill the virus, they do something to the immune response, damp it down, or potentially they do both. So hydroxychloroquine was promoted because in a test tube, it has antiviral activity. The only problem is it's been tested against a number of viruses over the last 50 years, and it's never really panned out to do very well. And so there's a long history of it being tested for HIV, for hepatitis B, for uh, influenza, a number of other viruses. And it's just never really panned out to, to show a good uh, effect on the clinical outcomes of a human being. The other thing that it does do, however, it does have some of an anti-inflammatory effect, which is why it's used for lupus patients. Uh, again, for the diseases for which it's been tested before, not a clear effect. Whether it has enough of an anti-inflammatory effect to help out with COVID, it hasn't shown up in the really good trials that have been done. And I'm gonna get back to how do we talk about really good trials versus not so good trials? What's the difference when we're talking about clinical research on these, on these uh, um, outcomes? So the two other things that you've heard a lot about uh, probably, one is remdesivir and that is an antiviral. There were some other antivirals that have been tested, some in good randomized controlled trials and a randomized controlled trial in brief means that you don't know what you're getting, okay? that the doctor doesn't know what you're getting if it's double-blinded. You don't know that the pill that you get has an antiviral in it or has a placebo. And that is one of the best ways to figure out if a drug makes a difference. So, uh, but remdesivir looked very promising because in the test tube it had good activity against all the other previously identified coronaviruses. And the other thing that was nice about it is it had been well tested for safety because it was one of the drugs that was tested in the large clinical trials that occurred uh, in Ebola in the Democratic Republic of Congo. And this is really important. The whole real problem that we have with coming up with good therapies in the middle of an outbreak is that 
giving humans experimental drugs or using them in an experimental way, if you're doing it for research, there are a huge amount of controls and regulations to protect human subjects. You can use the same drugs and just call it your best clinical judgment as a physician and be just as experimental in terms of using them on patients when it's not research, but you're calling it your best clinical judgment. And in those cases, there's a lot less protections for patients actually. But if it's in the setting of a clinical trial, there's a lot of rules and regulations and it takes a while to get them started. So with the West African Ebola outbreak, it took many months to get the first trials, first good trials of intervention started so that by the end of it, by the end of the entire big West Africa Ebola outbreak, we had very little data on what worked and what didn't. So a lot of, uh, of partners in the United States, NIH, WHO, there's a big push to try to be able to turn on these studies in a good formal fashion early on in an epidemic in order to test them. And that's what happened with remdesivir. So with some other products as well, but that's the one that uh, UTMB was involved in as one of the sites, uh, a number of sites worldwide, testing remdesivir against placebo. So remdesivir at this point was not FDA authorized, so it was definitely considered an experimental therapy. So it wasn't something like hydroxychloroquine that somebody could get off the shelf or a physician could prescribe. Um, and uh, what it meant was that we were able to do a very tight, well-controlled study. I didn't know which of my patients were getting remdesivir. They didn't know until we had enough data to show that it was clearly doing some good. And that was when uh, Dr. Fauci made the announcement in the Oval Office that the, really the first clinical trial of something showing effectiveness, first double-blinded randomized controlled clinical trial of uh, a treatment showing some degree of effectiveness uh, had gotten out there. And um, we got a bit of flack for making that announcement early. But the reason that we had to make it uh, early was because we, at that point, had enough information that we had to tell anybody who was getting placebo that they could get the real thing if they wanted to. So we knew it was going to hit the news. Anyway, so that is the first one that really came out with positive results um, from a tightly controlled, randomized controlled clinical trial. And that was really, really fulfilling. And, and so now, as you know, remdesivir is being uh, sent around the country and being used around the world, but it's an antiviral. We know it doesn't do a lot of good when somebody is deeply into that inflammatory response and perhaps already ventilated and so on. Uh, at that point, we need something else. So that's the dexamethasone. That's the next one that you've heard about that seems to show good results on, again, a less tight type of trial, but still randomized uh, controlled clinical trial of dexamethasone versus either other therapeutics or, uh, or no uh, other specific intervention. And so that's what you've heard about also is that dexamethasone. Now that's something that is relatively easily available. It is a type of steroid medication. So many people have taken prednisone or uh, hydrocortisone those are all steroids. And there was very mixed messaging or very mixed uh, clinical outcomes when it was used with SARS. We think it's looking like if used at the right time point with COVID, and that's probably later in the disease process when people start to have that inflammatory response. But again, not so late that they're already completely overwhelmed by it. So a lot of other uh, reports come out of that are what are called observational studies. And that confuses the public a lot of the times because these observational studies are a hospital or an individual who says, well, I tried this drug out on this bunch of people and this is how they did. And they seem to do well and they seem to do maybe better than the way that people did who don't get it, at least what I get from the reports. The problem is when you have that kind of a, uh, of a study, it gives us some information but it's not a planned study. It's a sort of, well, let me look back and see what happened. And what that means is that the people who got treatment and the people who didn't get treatment may not have been very much the same type of population. And so it's a lot harder to feel confident that that will be generalizable to other patients. So, um, so now there's a, a more 
products being tested. Um, we went on to continue for the next phase of the NIH trial that I was involved in to use everybody got remdesivir plus or minus another type of anti-inflammatory drug called baricitinib. We have completed enrollment for that, but we don't know all the results yet either. So the results all go up and disappear into the magic box at the NIH where they do all the statistics on it and then we'll really figure out how much of an effect that drug had on top of remdesivir. So combining an antiviral with an anti-inflammatory as well. And there's a lot more trials like that are, that are going on. And it's, it's really important for those trials to occur. It is difficult for both providers and the public to wait for a trial because the feeling is, well, this might work, so you've got to give it to everybody. But the problem is some of the things that might work may cause harm or they may prevent one from learning what really does and doesn't work. So getting these clinical trials into place during an epidemic is actually a really important activity that, uh, and, and I have to say that those of us that are involved in that are incredibly grateful to all of, they become study subjects when they join a subject, they join a, a study, but, uh, but they were patients. They were patients of mine very often, or they were patients of my colleagues, and they agreed to join this study and it's thanks to them that we know some of the things that we know now. And it's just really important so for, uh, for people to be willing to participate in these trials. Dr. McClellan, if you don't mind, can we uh, uh, have the audience ask a couple of questions? Uh, I think we're about down to 10 or 12 minutes and I'd like to get a couple of questions asked. Uh, Absolutely. But I, but I will be a little selfish. I'm gonna ask two quick ones. It doesn't matter to me who answers it, but. You know, we were, we were told early on that we can't wait till summer, get, summer gets here because the virus is, you know, it's going gonna, it's gonna to die out. It doesn't like heat. Of course, that's a myth, obviously, now. But the other one is the antibody testing. You know, I, I think I had it back in March. I've questioned myself whether to go get an antibody test or not. Are they accurate? Or are they not accurate? You know, every day it's a different story. Your thoughts? Hey, well, I'll go with the antibodies. I'll give, I'll give Scott the seasonality. Um, so the antibody testing is another one of these situations. So when we get an infection, we don't make one antibody. We make hundreds of antibodies. And they're antibodies to different parts of the organism. And, uh, and they may change uh, depending upon the stage of the disease. Some antibodies control the organism or are helpful in helping us to eradicate the organism. Some of them might stimulate the immunological response. And some of them don't do anything at all, but they're markers for the fact that we have the infection. So for example, with HIV, uh, when we do an antibody test, it doesn't mean we're immune because we have antibodies. The antibodies mean that you have HIV. So with that particular virus, the antibodies that we're testing don't mean that you're immune. So, uh, so everybody sort of wanted to believe, would love to believe, we would all love to believe that once you've had COVID, you're never gonna get it again and you are now immune. We don't know that yet. We also don't know that if you are immune for a period of time, how long it will last. Also, when people were creating these tests to measure antibodies to COVID, it's relatively easy to just create a test that measures any antibody. But creating a test that measures the antibodies that mean that you can fight off the infection is a lot harder. Also, there's a lot of coronaviruses. Some of them have similar things to which you can make antibodies on their surface or whatever. So you need to make sure that your test is identifying people who've had this particular, uh, the SARS-CoV-2 virus, not some other coronavirus. And so a lot of people came out with a lot of different antibody tests very quickly because there was such a huge demand. And I think the FDA has been kind of pushed back and forth about, gee, you know, getting stuff out quickly, not getting stuff out quickly and so on. So they approved under emergency authorization, a whole lot of these antibody tests, and now they've retracted it for a whole bunch of them because it's become clear that many of them are not very good. And the issue is also, depending on how many people you have in your population, if it misses 1% or if it tells you 1% are positive that aren't, that may be a huge impact on what actually happens when people get the test. So, um, so right now, I think um, there's not great agreement on which might be the best antibody test, and you certainly have to be very careful when you use them. They're useful on a population basis. Test a thousand people, X proportions seem to be positive. That's probably a reasonable ballpark about how many are positive, but on a one-to-one -one individual basis, it may not mean a lot for you whether you test positive or negative. Gotcha. 
just to follow up a little bit on that antibody question, the, the types of antibodies that Dr. McClellan mentioned that are probably the most predictive of whether you'll be protected from reinfection are called neutralizing antibodies. And uh, probably the most advanced neutralizing antibody test yet developed was developed here at UTMB. It's being used right now for the clinical trials of vaccines to measure the responses in, in the volunteers for those vaccine trials. But hopefully, ultimately, this test will become available to the general population um, ba based on um, a way of, of taking a traditional neutralizing test and making it much faster and able to run many, many more samples in a laboratory. So stay tuned for more about that antibody test. The question about seasonality, uh, th the main reason that we, we expected to see some reduction in the summer was all of these other common cold viruses, influenza virus, um, usually do show a strong pattern of seasonality. They, they show up in the fall, they peak in the winter, they disappear around the spring. And even um, the last, for example, the last pandemic of influenza in 2009, H1N1, it had a peak in the spring, then it slowed down a little over the summer, and then it had another larger peak in the fall. But I think especially in our part of the country, um, probably the reason for this seasonality doesn't hold true as well here. Probably the main reason we see this with a lot of respiratory viruses is in many parts of the world, during the summer, people spend a lot more time outdoors. And when we talk about spread through uh, the air and and droplets or aerosols, if you're outdoors and there's any wind at all, those uh, aerosols will be dissipated very quickly. So if you're outdoors, uh, even now in Galveston, you're probably in general in a much safer place than anywhere indoors. But as you know, uh, unlike cooler parts of the country where people do spend a lot of summertime outdoors here, in our part of the country, they probably spend maybe even more time indoors than during the winter because uh, we have air conditioning and being out in the middle of the day is pretty oppressive. So that's probably the main reason why we haven't seen a lot of impact on spread. And maybe part of the reason why we're seeing a lot of the, the biggest impacted areas in the Southern United States right now, because the virus got started a little bit slower here, but now spread can be very efficient in the summer when everybody's staying inside in their air conditioned offices or spaces, homes, and uh, if they don't have good ventilation and they're not distancing and not wearing masks, they can be very efficient spread through a uh, respiratory route. Thank you, Dr. Weaver. Uh, I'm gonna let my buddy ask a question, Jeff. Bob, thank you, and, and doctors, thank you so much. I know we're not gonna be able to get to all the questions, and so I think maybe if we can capture the questions uh, maybe we can forward those to you and, and provide some feedback to the folks that I think we ended up with over 100 people on this call today. There's uh, about 200, Jeff. Okay. With one of the things that's the most common topic has to do with schools. And Dr. Weaver, with what you talked about with the airborne transmissions in your recent study, um, could you just talk a little bit? Every community is, is confronted with dealing with schools coming back in session. And do you have any thoughts along those lines? Well, I think it's a very difficult question to answer. Even if tomorrow were the, the start of the school year, it would be very difficult to know how or if we could open school safely. Um, and because the school year is not gonna start for another five or six weeks, that makes it even more difficult to, to anticipate what kind of conditions we'll be seeing at that time. Um, you know the. The, the same principles that we uh, have t talked about already, distancing, masking, good ventilation, uh, all those are critical to keeping schools safe. But also just the amount of, of spread in the community is a very important factor. If there's a good chance that a teacher or a student will show up infected, that increases the risk that we'll have spread in the classroom. And uh, um, even though children seem to be less susceptible to severe disease and maybe they spread a little bit less efficiently, it's very difficult to control the behavior of children, especially young children in preschool, for example. So uh, I think that uh, it's really too difficult, too early to answer that question about what we're gonna be able to do later in August. 
it's probably going to depend very much on local conditions, even school by school conditions, what uh, the, the space available in an individual school, how much you can spread the students out to, to maintain the safe distance, um, whether, uh, whether you can have shifts of, of some students being at school certain days and others different days uh, to make up for that lack of space. Just a very complicated question that I think uh, nobody can really answer for sure now. And maybe in a, in a month if some of these new uh, restrictions really take a, an effect on reducing transmission and transmission is down a lot, then maybe I think we can start looking more carefully at what can be done. But I think it's far too early right now. Dr. McClellan, please uh, follow up with your thoughts. Yeah, no, I, I agree with all those. And rather than elaborate any further on that, I, I think there's a lot to parse there, including especially for kindergarten age kids and stuff like that. Uh, they might have more upper respiratory than lower and stuff like that, but they don't cough as well. So I was going to try to hit real quickly some of the questions on the chat line and, and uh, I'm told to keep my answers super short. So I'm going to try to, that, try to do that. Um, uh, so enhanced immunity, can you get it multiple times? We don't know. Right? That's what we're trying to do, those neutralizing antibody tests to find out. So we really don't know if you can get it multiple times. Uh, question about mass filtering one to five micron aerosolized droplets, and the answer is no. That's not what they're designed to do. There's no question if you tried, you could get some of these aerosolized uh, one to five micron droplets through the kind of cloth facial coverings that were, are being recommended. But the idea is you're reducing the amount of virus that you're spewing out of your mouth, you're reducing the amount can breathe in. It's not 100%, but this is not a virus that you need only one viral particle to get infected. So everything you do to look at the probability that you get infected, you add those things together. And all of those things work together. The masking, the distancing, the hand washing, all of those things go together. Not one single thing is your 100% bulwark against infection. A uh, question about some of the antibody cocktails and so on and, and how those will work. And so those have had some good activity in other diseases. Uh, none of those have come out with a full randomized controlled trial yet, but some of those are in progress and we'll hopefully get some, some answers, some really good answers on that too. The ideal thing for us to have is an antiviral that can be taken as a pill when you know you've been exposed. We'd love to have that. We don't have that yet. But there are a couple of candidates, again, that might be tested for that, but they're still in relatively early trials. That would be the ideal thing for very early onset of, of disease to be able to take as an outpatient uh, or in case of uh, an unknown exposure. <laughs> I love this one. How much do you believe schools are like bars in terms of spread of the virus? Well, it depends how much you drink in school. But, um, <laughs> but it's also that, uh, Schools are, bars really are a place where you get together to be snug, to be close to your friends and to talk loudly with them. And I think that that's, so it's very hard to impose social distancing. And because you are drinking while you're drinking, it's very, hard, you know, now in New Orleans, where I'm from, there is somebody who's created a mask with a little flap to put a straw through so that you can drink without taking your mask off. But that, that doesn't seem to have become popular. So I think bars are, a little more dangerous because of the combination of talking, usually loud talking to overcome the music. Uh, you really are there to be close with your friends. Uh, I think schools can do a little bit more management probably um, and hopefully the children will not be inebriated. Uh, some questions about, for example, uh, budesonide. Again, that's one that is being discussed in the lay press without any good randomized clinical trials to say whether it is better as an inhaled thing or whatever. Certainly it is another steroid, okay? So if steroids work, it probably does something, but is it better than dexamethasone? Well, it will not affect inhaled budesonide, for example, is not going to affect the other parts of your system that are undergoing that inflammatory response, and that is a system-wide event. So, so again, budesonide may have some impact, but until it is tested in a good clinical trial, just stories of, of a few examples of what somebody did well isn't going to do it. Convalescent plasma, I think, was mentioned. That's the whole antibody thing. Uh, we, UTMB, 
many randomized controlled trials. Johns Hopkins University is doing that. We do have convalescent plasma available on what's called uh, basically a compassionate use, where we do collect the information on people who've gotten it, but because it's not compared directly with exactly the same type of patient who hasn't gotten it, uh, we, we will not be kind of collecting the kind of data that really proves its, its effectiveness like a controlled trial. Dr. McClellan, just to respect everybody's time, because I, I, I do know that you guys are on a very tight schedule. So uh, if, if we can, Jimmy can maybe put some of those questions together, send them to y'all, and maybe we can get those answers back out to the people that are attending. Again, we have over 200 people on this call, so there's a lot of questions. Um, but let me, before I close it, I do want to thank you, Dr. McClellan and Dr. Weaver, for taking time to share that uh, all this wonderful information. It, 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 it's helped, helped us all. And we do appreciate it, okay? I also want to thank Becky at UTMB for uh, making this happen. Harriet, for kind of uh, rounding up all the troops to get to be on the call. And then, of course, I can't thank uh, Jimmy enough about setting this Zoom meeting up. Uh, the technical stuff is over my head, and Jimmy makes sure that uh, the whole thing functions well. So, Jimmy, thank you for doing that. Jeff, do you have a couple comments before we close? No, just thanks, everybody, so much. This was a great session today, so... I echo all of your comments. Thank you, Bob. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you both, doctors. I really appreciate it. Thank you. Pleasure to be with you. Yep.